So it's uh, such a pleasure to be at Politics and Prose, uh, a thriving independent, which is more or less an oxymoron in these uh, times, but, uh, but here we are, and it's happening, so it's uh, such a treat. I'm going to start by taking you through a journey that I've taken uh, into the 18th century. People say I actually sort of entered the 18th century about 15, 16 years ago at the age of 50. And people say in the, in the revolutionary community that uh, once you enter the 18th late 18th century, you pretty much never fully return. And uh, much to my wife, Marie Chagrin, that uh, has happened to me too. Uh, I started out by just investigating uh, common people. I was actually working on some curriculum for schools. And I wanted to bring to, bring to the fore the contributions and, and just real life experiences of common people during the revolutionary era. And, in, and the underreported people, uh, poor farmers, uh, 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 the fighting men and boys, uh, women, African Americans, Native Americans. And I compiled the, uh, the great wealth of, of, his, of scholarly literature into a form that, that I think was accessible to the general public. And that's what the People's, Revolution, People's History of the American Revolution was. But within that, well, when I was researching that, uh, I came across a peculiar reference. It, people occasionally would, would refer to, uh, uh, un, uh, let's say, rural unrest in Massachusetts, a bit of rural unrest. So I said, well, that sounds kind of interesting. What was actually that rural unrest? Very few secondary sources had anything about it, so that sent me back to the archives. And what I found, and now I'm going to describe some of the rural unrest. Uh, what happened is in the wake of the Tea Party, Boston Tea Party, the British Imperial Government passed the Coercive Acts, and we know a lot about the Boston Port Act, and supposedly everybody helped Boston, and somehow that act of generosity, everybody helping Boston, led to a revolution. And that's kind of the, the official story, and I'm not quite sure of the plausibility of that story. There was another act that, uh, that Parliament passed, which was much more harsh. It actually revoked the 1691 Charter, or the Constitution, of Massachusetts. New England town meetings in, in place for, for more than a century, outlawed. You could meet once a year, and that one, and that one time all agenda items had to be approved by the governor, the royal governor. Uh, you, your, your representatives had absolutely no power. Uh, the people who they used to appoint were all appointed by the king. Basically, it was total political disenfranchisement. Now, the revoking of that constitution triggered the, quote, rural unrest. Here's what happened. Uh, in every local county seat, they called them shire towns, in 1774, as soon as the local government was sh slated to convene, that is, the, British, uh, British, uh, the local government under British authority, uh, the people would gather, and they would actually, in the town of Worcester, for instance, uh, the people uh, said, okay, we're not going to let this, this, this government happen. Uh, this, because as soon as they meet under the new government, that's kind of, san you know, this new act, it kind of sanctions it. So in the town of Worcester, there's only 300 actual citizens. And they send out word through the committees of correspondence throughout the whole county. And on the appointed day, 4,622 militiamen from actually in their militia companies from 37 townships throughout Worcester County, all the way from New Hampshire to, uh, to, to the uh, Connecticut border. This represents fully half the adult male population of Worcester County at the time. Convenes in one time in one place, riding up to 60 miles each to get there and unseat British authority. And how they do it is this. Uh, there's 25 court-appointed officials, and uh, the Patriots take over the courthouse, and the 25 uh, officials are kind of forced to huddle in Daniel Haywood's tavern halfway down Main Street. And after they kind of work out the details, what's going to happen, and what they do is they force each one of these one at a time to come out of the tavern, hat in hand, and start walking the gauntlet between these militiamen who are all lined up in their companies, uh, reciting his resignation first once for this group, but the, you know there's no microphone there. So then they recite it again, and all, each one of these people had to do this over 30 times. And then not content with the officials, they gathered all the Tories in town, made them do the same thing. You know, I will never support this abusive act in the British authority. That was the end of British authority in Worcester. This is happening in every shire town in Massachusetts. In Plymouth, the people got so pumped up after this, uh, after doing a similar event, they went down to Plymouth Rock and said, we can move this thing. 
and they all try to gather around and like, you know, lift it, and they were going to bring it up to the courthouse. Well, they probably had the, the brute strength, but they couldn't get the logistics out, so Plymouth Rock is where it is. But, but that gives you the idea of the power here, okay? And, um, uh, and in the wake of this, in the town of Worcester, they instruct their representative to the new provincial congress, which is taking the place of the old assembly. This, by the way, is before Lexington and Concord. So they instruct, him, they instruct him to say, it is time to form a new government as from the ashes of the phoenix of the old. In other words, independence. And, it's, and no matter what our enemies might say about it. So they were ready to take the big step. This is to the day, 21 months before the Congressional Declaration of Independence. Okay, that's the short version. The longer version is in my second book, The First American Revolution. Uh, but now that's obviously, you know, people are kind of like, what's going on? How come I, isn't that the first question? Everybody's thinking, what? How come I don't know this? That was certainly my question. How can you tell the story of a revolution without not, not only, f f not, not just not featuring, but not even mentioning the actual overthrow of political and military authority? It makes absolutely no sense. And so I'm wondering, like, what happened to that story? Who decides these stories that have kind of filtered down? Who's the gatekeeper here? You know, because we had this grand wealth of, 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 of history at the revolutionary time, and generation after generation after generation is kind of like narrowed it down until we get to seven people. And that's it, <laughs> usual crowd, the founders, and that's kind of what we have. Um, so I asked that, and I say, who's the gatekeeper? And that led to my third book, Founding Myths. And in Founding Myths, I take several, actually 13 of the myths that we, I mean, the stories that we know, Valley Forge, uh, Shot Heard Around the World, uh, Paul Revere's Ride, and, um, and I say, now, when did this story really develop in the way, in the sense, in the way that we hear it? And it turned out, in, in all cases, they developed during the 19th century, not at the time. They were, they were added after, they were kind of, and here's the danger of it. Let's take Paul Revere's Ride. You know, the lone rider from Boston comes and wakes up the sleepy-eyed farmers, right? You know, and they're all, and then they kind of like they're okay. They're woken, and then they go with their shotguns and they take pot shots at the British, and and uh, and then that's the beginning of the war. Um, okay, the sleepy-eyed farmers. Now, I've just told you about who these farmers were, and they were not that sleepy-eyed. They were not. They did not need a one man from Boston to to awake them. And in fact, as a matter of fact, the whole Paul Revere ride, you know, that the story we know was invented by Longfellow in 1861 which is 80, you know, 86 years after the fact, and he's trying to rouse the people in the, in the beginning of the this, uh, this Civil War. But to do so, he wants to tell a children's story. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the early histories uh, of, of the Revolution are all about telling children's stories to give models that the people can then, that the children can then emulate. So these stories yeah, reduce <coughs> these grand wealth of, of information into single individual tales of, of, of heroism as in Paul Revere. Uh, of course, Paul Revere, he's, he never waited for the signal lanterns. That was another fellow who waited. He helped set it up, and another fellow waited. That other fellow was never heard of again. The whole, si the two, one if by land, two if by sea, that, that, that thread of the story in actual fact leads nowhere. You know, Paul Revere, by the time he started on his ride, the people in Lexington had already been alerted. They were already gathered at the tavern there. Um, so the, you know, the story, and it's not that Paul Revere wasn't important. He was one of many people who were involved in, an, in, in this amazing patriot network. Because after that revolution that I told you about the previous summer, the whole, the, all the, all towns in Massachusetts, they started, they came together in a provincial congress. They raised taxes. They said, no longer do any taxes get paid to the British, pay it to us. They armed, they had, the, they had their shopping list, they started to get caching powder, uh, artillery, weapons. Um, they, they trained, that's when the Minutemen started. The Minutemen started in Worcester two weeks after the overthrow because they know the British are going to counterattack. They work on this, this great intelligence network, okay? So, um, so what uh, uh, that Re Revere is a part of, that's the full story. It's an awesome story, it's an amazing story, and it's not told. I go through in founding this 13 of such derivations, showing not only how the, the story was, was created, but the deeper story that it hides. And so, but that naturally suggests another. See, each one of these books leads to another one. And that suggests, in my mind, I, I see why these stories are created. They're created partly to kind of build a kind of a certain version of nationalism uh, in the 19th century, and they, and they stick because they're good stories. 